The Convair XF-92 was one of the first aircraft built with the Delta Wing and inspired some of the most important aircraft in history. Still, test pilots usually hated to fly it, including legendary pilot Scott Crossfield. Most aircraft, particularly ones that can fly faster than the speed of sound, have a Delta Wing design, and it was the XF-92 that inspired it. At the time it was built, it was unlike anything that had ever flown before. However, without being anyone's favorite, the Convair XF-92 flew over 300 times between 1948 and 1953 and became one of the most influential experimental aircraft in history. Eventually, even Hollywood came calling, but even there, it had a tough break. Delta. In August of 1945, just before the war officially ended, the United States Army Air Forces, soon to be renamed the Air Force, issued a request for proposal for a supersonic interceptor capable of speeds of up to 700 miles per hour and that could reach 50,000 feet altitudes in four minutes. By May of 1946, Convair emerged the victor with the P-92, an interceptor with a V-shaped butterfly tail and a delta wing sweep of 45 degrees, all powered by a single 1,560-pound Westinghouse J30WE1 turbojet and six 2,000-pound liquid-fueled rocket engines. The P-92 aircraft was envisioned as a fast-point defense interceptor, with range and endurance sacrificed to focus solely on all-out performance. However, when wind tunnel testing shed light on several critical problems with the design, the Convair team went back in time to read the wartime research of Dr. Alexander Lippisch, a pioneer in Delta Wings. Lippisch began his Delta Wing research in the 1930s, and throughout the war, he conceived over 50 radical designs for Nazi Germany's Luftwaffe, including the rocket-powered ME-163B1 Comet. The shape in the wing, named after the Greek letter Delta, had a significant number of advantages, including a sharp angle with reduced drag, and even though it could be considered as being very thin, it was still solid and efficient. To support his designs and test the wing shape's low-speed characteristics, Dr. Lippisch built a small model glider, and as the Allies closed in on the falling Nazi Empire, Lippisch's Delta Wing research and glider were confiscated. Lippisch was among the German scientists and engineers that were recruited as part of Operation Paperclip, the program that brought experts to the United States to work on government programs. After a thorough FBI investigation, it was concluded that the German scientist hadn't been an ardent Nazi, and he gladly volunteered to continue his work in aircraft design with the Americans. When the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, NASA's predecessor, finally tested out the Delta Wing's potential at their wind tunnel research facilities, Dr. Lippisch's radical research was the subject of much excitement amongst American aircraft corporations. Change of plans. After several conferences with Lippisch, the Convair team decided to modify their aircraft into a Delta Wing. In November of 1946, the newly renamed United States Air Force authorized Convair to build a smaller research aircraft model to speed development and gain in-flight experience with the new wing layout. Many of the aircraft's components were taken from already existing aircraft to save time and money, including the main undercarriage from an American FJ-1 Fury, engine and hydraulics from a Lockheed P-89 Shooting Star, rudder pedals from the BT-13 trainer, and the ejection seat and cockpit canopy from a canceled experimental jet. The aircraft was completed in December of 1947 in San Diego and was sent without engines to NACA's aeronautical laboratory at Moffett Field for wind tunnel testing. When the tests proved successful, the experimental aircraft was fitted with a 4,250-pound Allison J-33 turbojet. However, by the time the upgraded aircraft was ready to begin testing, the request for proposal for a point defense interceptor was already outdated, and the project was cancelled. Still, Convair renamed the aircraft to XF-92, and on March 26, 1948, the model was loaded aboard a Navy landing ship and taken to the Moroc Army Airfield, where it would serve and fly hundreds of flight tests. Air Force Testing Although the F-92 project ended before it began, Delta Wing Model 7002 was ready to fly. On April 1, 1958, XF-92's maiden flight was thwarted as it showed a series of inadvertent hops during its high-speed taxi test at the hands of Condair test pilot Sam Shannon. The model's first official flight then happened on September 18th. After proving its airworthiness, Phase 1 of the project began, conducted by Shannon and fellow test pilot William Martin. Then, 
After a final flight to close Phase 1 on August 26, 1949, Phase 2 was turned over to record-setting test pilot Chuck Yeager. Phase 2 began only a day short of the two-year anniversary of Yeager's infamous Mach 1 flight and lasted through December 28, 1949. Major Frank Everest also participated in the tests to assess if the aircraft met the contract specifications. It only took two months for Phase 2 to be completed, and even if the XF-92 had several shortcomings, including severe pitch problems, the aircraft had proved that a Delta Wing plane was practical and safe to use. Over the next three years, the XF-92 flew occasionally, primarily to test the aircraft's performance and J-33 engine, as well as to familiarize other popular pilots with the Delta Wing technology, including Colonel Albert Boyd, Colonel Fred Escani, Major Jack Ridley, and Captain Joe Wolfe. The aircraft was eventually grounded for repairs in the tail cone, and for a large part of 1952, further problems deterred any additional flights. Then, when the Air Force was done with their testing, the military branch turned the aircraft over to NACA. The plane nobody wanted to fly. The NACA research flights began on April 9, 1953, under pilot Scott Crossfield. During his introductory flight, he had a terrible but memorable experience as he taxied across the lake bed. As the pilot recalled years later, quote, Nobody wanted to fly the XF-92. There was no lineup of pilots for that airplane. It was a miserable flying beast. Before the taxi maneuver, Crossfield had been instructed to keep the nose up to slow down the aircraft. However, he couldn't get the XF-92 back up after doing so, as it didn't have enough tail power to do it. As Crossfield continued to struggle, he recalled, quote, So that airplane was rolling like mad towards the edge of the lake bed. I saw a county road off to the left, and I managed to get that thing turned and head up that county road. Burned out the brakes, just melted them right there. Rolled up that county road about a hundred yards, and fortunately no damage to the airplane. Came out pretty well, except the brakes were all burned off. The county road where the pilot landed was later renamed Crossfield Pike. This series of trials revealed that the aircraft had a tendency to pitch up violently during high-speed turns and maneuvers. Convair and NACA consequently installed wing fences and fixed aerodynamic devices attached to aircraft wings to solve the problem. Meanwhile, Crossfield continued to fly the aircraft 25 more times between April and October of 1953. The first half of the tests were to study data on the plane's dynamic and structural longitudinal stability, directional control, longitudinal and lateral stability, and low-speed stability and control. These lengthy trials were followed by 10 more flights to test different wing fence configurations, six of them at speeds just under Mach 1. The aircraft's last four flights with NACA gathered data on low-speed lateral and directional control with the wing fences. Then, on October 14th, the aircraft's luck ran out. As it was undertaking low-speed lateral and directional control flights without its wing fences, the XF-92 landed on a lake bed crashing nose-first into the land. Legacy Although Crossfield was unharmed in the incident, the same couldn't be said of the XF-92, which never flew again. The experimental aircraft was eventually donated to the University of the South before being transferred to its current home, the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. Still, other than its famous wing configuration, the aircraft was supposed to be immortalized on the big screen. In the Howard Hughes film Jet Pilot, starring John Wayne and Janet Leigh, the aircraft was repainted and posed as a Russian MiG-23 fighter aircraft. However, by the time the film was released in 1957, after years of delays, the experimental aircraft's footage had been cut from the film. But the XF-92 finally appeared on the big screen in the film Toward the Unknown, starring William Holton. This time, it was under the guise of an F-102 Delta Dagger, an interceptor aircraft that was the backbone of the U.S. Air Force's air defense in the late 1950s. Still, the legacy and impact of the Delta Wing research lived on, despite the program's abrupt cancellation. Although the XF-92 was not liked, the Convair design concept showed a great deal of promise, and the Delta Wing was used on several designs through the 1950s and 1960s. The knowledge behind the experimental aircraft eventually traveled all the way to France, where Mirage aircraft also used Delta Wings. In addition, the European Eurofighter Typhoon carried the Delta Wing technology into the 21st century. Ultimately, the legacy of the XF-92 program can be seen in aircraft from different companies, such as the F-102 and F-106 interceptors, the XF-2Y1 Sea Dart jet seaplane fighter, the B-58 strategic bomber, 
and even today in the F-22 Raptor. Thank you for watching our Dark Skies video. Don't forget to leave us a comment and like and subscribe to all our Dark Documentaries channels. Also, hit the notification button to be the first to know of our new content.